Let's invite Jesus to um, be with us as we go into our next chapter of Incomparable. We're up to Matthew chapter 14, and um, there's, so many, there's so many awesome stories in this chapter, so let's pray and, and get into it. Father in heaven, Lord, we just love you so much, and I just pray that you, your Holy Spirit would just work through me and work upon the hearts of every person here, um, so that a message from you may, may be preached today. And Lord, Everyone is here with different stories and different experiences of the week, and some people have had a great week, some people had a terrible week, but Lord, may the message today encourage us and, and um, encourage us to, to live out what you have, to, you desire for us in, in our lives this week. Um, may what we learn be accurate to the Bible text, Father, and, um, and may it be an individual message for each person, in Jesus' name, Amen. Matthew chapter 14. I was wondering how I was going to present this because there's so much in this chapter. So what I'm going to do is sort of share the big overview of the story. And then, because all the story is all interconnected, and then we're going to go back and we're going to look at five sort of major things that I've got out of chapter, the story of chapter 14. And so the story begins with John the Baptist in prison. Now the reason he was in prison was because of a man named Herod, and Herod was the ruler of the area around Galilee. And John the Baptist had been rebuking Herod because he'd, been, he'd taken his brother's wife as his own. Okay, that's a bit twisted and messed up. But John the Baptist, in, without any fear or any uh, worry about what the repercussions might be, was just telling Herod, you can't be doing this, this is unlawful. And so Herod, feeling the conviction and wanting to silence him, he was probably doing this publicly, um, put him in prison. And so um, John the Baptist was just there languishing away in, in, in prison, uh, waiting for something to happen. Now, fast forward, forwarding the story a little bit, we see uh, it's Herod's birthday, and he has this big drunken feast that he, he throws. And during that, that birthday, Herod's brother's wife, Herodias, her daughter comes out and dances for them. So now it gets a little bit more twisted. And this pleases Herod. And so he says to Herodias' daughter, and says, ask me anything and I'll give you whatever you ask. And so she goes to her mother and sort of conspires together and comes back and says, we want John the Baptist's head on a platter. And so uh, Herod's there and he thinks, oh, this is a bit of a, I don't really want to do this. But he said he made this, and he and he given he asked for this with an oath and, and promised, and every, all these other guests were there, and he didn't want to go back on his word, so he says, "Okay," and he orders the execute, execution of John the Baptist, and his head is brought on a platter to uh, Herodias' daughter, and then she gives it to her mother. So that's the backdrop for chapter 14. Now, um, John the, John the Baptist's disciples come and they take his body and they. Um, and they go and bury him, and then they go to Jesus, and they give him word about what's, what's just happened. And Jesus is just, and you read, when you read through the story, you just get this sense that Jesus is just filled with, with grief. And also, it's, it's, it's like a little bit of a foreshadowing of what is going to take place in Jesus' own life. So he hears of the, the, the martyr's death of John the Baptist, and it makes him just realize all the more, in a very graphic way, what's going to happen to himself. And so he seeks out a place of retreat, a place to spend some time with his Father in heaven, and he gets the disciples together, and they hop into a boat, and they go across the Sea of Galilee. They get to the other side, hoping to have a nice place of, of, of quiet and solitude, and they get there, and they're met with a gigantic crowd of people, and the crowd is so big, at the end when they counted up the crowd, they said there was 5,000 men, and if you include all the women, all the children, there's probably 20,000 people here. And this huge crowd, and they're all just bringing all the sick that they can find in all the surrounding areas, and they're saying, Jesus, heal us, help us, teach us. And Jesus, just desperate for some time alone, spends that time healing them. Whatever their disease they have, whatever they need, Jesus meets that need. And he labors with them all the way through till the evening. Now, because those people had rushed to come around the lake, they didn't prepare any, any food or any sort of provisions for the day, 
And by evening time, they're tired, and Jesus was already tired, and now he's super tired, and the disciples are tired, and the disciples come to Jesus, and they say, Jesus, just send the crowds away and let them go back to their homes and get something to eat. But Jesus looks at them and says, don't send them away. Give them something to eat. And the disciples kind of look at each other and, uh, Jesus, we don't have anything either. And there's 20,000 people here. We can't feed them. And then one of the disciples comes up and says, we've got five loaves and two fish here. And Jesus says, that'll do. Bring them to me. And he holds it up and he prays over that little, little meal. And then he gives it back and says, okay, go give it to the people. And as the disciples, they break the bread and they, and they hand around the, the fish, as they break it and they, it just multiplies um, as they do that. And then it, it feeds this group of people here and it just keeps going and going and going and going until soon the entire crowd of 20,000 people or so is fed and there's 12 baskets left over. And it, it reminds me of that story, if you're here, when um, we heard the story of the team that went to Africa with Wayne and um, Matt Botton and Takoa, and, and they were handing out these Bibles, and they looked out, and there was, this, there was so many kids there, and they thought, we don't think we have enough Bibles, but the Bibles just kept coming. The more they handed out, the more it kept coming, and this is what was taking place here. The more bread and the more fish they handed out, it just kept coming and coming and coming and coming until everyone is fed. But then afterwards, Jesus then, he didn't want to send them away before, but now that they're fed, he says, okay, let's send the, the crowd away, Disciples, hop in your boat, go back over the lake. I'm going to spend some time by myself. And Jesus goes up onto the mountain and he, and he spends the night there praying and, and spending that time with God. And during the night, there, there was this incredible storm that came up over the, over the sea. And Jesus, um, the disciples are out there battling against the storm and they're not making much, much progress because there's a strong headwind and they're battling against the storm. And Jesus decides to... Go and meet them in the boat. Now, he didn't have a boat himself, so as he just decided to walk on the water. And I just sort of imagine there's this furious um, storm happening, and Jesus' wind, is, his hair is blowing in the wind, and he's going up over the waves and down over the waves and walking out, and eventually starts walking past their boat. And the disciples see this, and they freak out, and it's a ghost. And Jesus says, have courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. And then Peter says, Jesus, if it is really you, command me to come out on the water with you. Just a moment of spontaneous boldness from Peter there. And Jesus says, come. So Peter hops out of the boat without really thinking and starts walking out towards Jesus. He almost gets there and suddenly he kind of has a moment of, what am I actually doing here? And I, kind of, I sort of imagine that maybe as the waves went up and down and Jesus sort of just sunk beneath one of the waves in front, and, and suddenly Peter's focusing on the waves and he looks at the wind and the storm and he, and he starts to panic. And as he starts to panic, he starts to sink into the water and he, and he looks out at Jesus and says, Lord, save me. And immediately he, this strong hand of Jesus reaches down and takes hold of Peter's and takes him back up onto the water. And together they walk back and they hop into the boat. And then they go on their way and we move into chapter 15. So that's the story. And... As I was unpacking this and researching this, this story this week, one of the things that really jumped out to me is the power of Jesus. And that's what I've called the message today, the power of Jesus. This is just everywhere in this story. Firstly, we have the crowds that Jesus is healing. It seems that no matter what disease or sickness is brought to Jesus, the leper, the blind, whoever it is, Jesus knows the right thing to do and his power is sufficient to meet that, that problem. And then we see Jesus' his power to provide, and there's this need of food, and he has, his power has the solution for their, for their need. And then we see that Jesus has this incredible power over creation itself, over nature. And he just, defying the laws of physics, just walks along the water, just this incredible showcase of power. And I want you to open up your Bibles to Matthew chapter 14. And I wanted to show you a little bit more about the, just this, the power of Jesus over creation in this text. So Matthew chapter 14 and verse, uh, where are you? verse 32. 
Matthew 14, verse 32, we have Jesus has just rescued Peter out of the water, and they're walking back to the boat, and they hop in, and it says in verse 32, and when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. Now, it's not unusual for wind to sort of just stop, but here we see that this stopping of the storm is connected with, with, with Jesus himself. And just like when Jesus spoke to the, the storm and um, said, be still, and the wind and the waves stopped, we see that take place here as well. Jesus has this incredible power over creation itself. And in the Mark account, I've got this up on the screen, oh, sorry, John, John chapter 6, verse 21, it says that when then they were glad to take him into the boat, speaking of this exact same story, and it says, and immediately the boat was at the land to which they were going. Now, how did that happen? Okay, they're battling all night long against this furious storm, not getting anywhere, this, this headwind, and then Jesus hops in the boat and boom, it hits the sand on the other side. Jesus has this incredible power over creation itself. And by the end of the chapter, when we get to verse 34, we see that the power is just overflowing from Jesus. Verse 34 says, And when they had crossed over, they came to land at Gennesaret. And when the men of that place recognized him, they sent around to all that region and brought to him all who were sick and implored him that they might only touch the fringe of his garment. And as many as touched it were made well. You get this sense that there's a lot of people here. So it says they went to all of the land, brought all of the sick, and as many as just touched his garment of his clothes. This power is just exuding from him. It's just overflowing to everyone around them. And Jesus is meeting the needs of all who come to him. And so we see the power of Jesus on display. Now, why is Jesus able to have such incredible power? There's a couple of hints that really speak to Jesus' true identity here. Well, there's lots, really, just the fact that there's so much power coming from him. But there's a couple of other little clues as to the identity of Jesus in this passage. And the first one is in verse 27. So, Matthew 14, verse 27, it says, this is when Jesus is walking past the boat, but immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, "'Take heart, it is I, do not be afraid.'" Now, we miss something here in the English translations, and that is the, the, the little phrase there that says, it is I, is the Greek phrase, ego I me. Okay, and translated, if you just translate that directly, it's I am. It's the same phrase that we find in John. Some of you might be familiar with, with where Jesus says, before Abraham was, I am. And it takes our mind right back to where? The burning bush. In the burning bush, we see God shows up in this, in this, this bush, and, the, and it's on fire, and it's not burning up. And God tells um, Moses to go and talk to Pharaoh, and he says, well, what if they don't believe me? And who should I say sent me? And God says, tell them, I am have sent you. I am who I am. Okay? I am is the great God of Scripture, the God who parted the, the Red Sea. And here we see that same God is not parting the Red Sea, but is walking on the sea and is speaking, or later he'll be speaking to the sea, and, and he has this incredible control over creation. Here we see the great I am is at work. And then when they hop into, into the boat in verse, uh, where are we here? Verse 32. It says, And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly you are the Son of God. What does it mean for Jesus when he here accepts their worship? There's a couple of other passages in Scripture where people or we're going to see angels are worshipped, and we see that they immediately stop the person worshipping them. And it's interesting when we compare these accounts. One of them is, takes place in Acts. So cast your mind right back to our Acts series devoted. Acts chapter 10, we see Peter is coming to Cornelius' house. It says, when Peter entered, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter lifted him up saying, stand up. I too am a man, okay? Immediately rebuked him, saying, I am not deserving of worship. Why wasn't he deserving of worship? There's only one person who is deserving of worship. And we see this as well in uh, Revelation chapter 22. Here we have John, who's been seeing this incredible vision from this, given to him by this angel. And it says, I, John, John am the one who heard and saw these things. 
And when I heard and saw them, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who showed them to me. But he said to me, you must not do that. How come? He said, I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers, the prophets, and with those who keep the words of this book. Worship God. If an angel came here today and we worshipped him, we would be completely out of place. The only person who is to be worshipped is God. And Jesus, when he's on the boat, he doesn't rebuke his disciples and say, worship God, because they were worshipping God. And so here in chapter 14, we see the divinity of Christ and the power of Christ on full display. And it reminds us that when we're examining the story of Jesus, we're examining God. And that's a really important and really important point. When we see that Mary is holding this baby in her arms, she's holding God himself. When Jesus reaches out and touches the leper, we see the act of kindness and the love of God reaching out and touching that, that leper. When Jesus is weeping for, the, for Lazarus, when he's hanging on the cross, that's our mighty God in heaven, who, well, not in heaven at that point, in the, in the person of Jesus, um, giving up everything for us. The power of Jesus and his divinity is the first of the five points we're going to look at about the power of Jesus today. Now, the second, the second one is the power of Jesus and his compassion. Now, when we read through this chapter, we see God's power on full display, but equally we see God's compassion on full display. And I want to show you that now. Now, when Jesus hears the words of John the Baptist, he's filled with grief, and he wants to go and find a quiet place by himself. But it's not just for him only. In Mark, again, because this story is in a, couple, in a number of the Gospels, in the Mark account, it says, the apostles returned to Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. And he said to them, so imagine these disciples have been sent out, they've been going around preaching about the kingdom, and they come in, and Jesus says to them, Come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest a while. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. So the first person that we see God has, Jesus has compassion on here is the weary workers that he sent out. Come aside and rest a while. The next group that Jesus has compassion on is the desperate crowds. In verse, uh, where are we? Verse 13. Chapter 14, verse 13, it says, Now when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there to the boat to a desolate place by himself. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. Have you ever wanted to get by yourself, have some time by yourself, and you've sort of done something in order to get away from people, and the place where you go just suddenly ends up being the most distracting, most distracting chaotic place that you could have chosen? Maybe you go down to the beach with your Bible or something, and you get down there, and all of a sudden you meet like a group from church that are down there or something, and you think, no, I wanted to spend some time by myself. That's what we see with Jesus here. He goes across the sea, he gets there, and there's 20,000 people. Jesus could have said, hang on, guys, I knew I'm just going to spend all this time by myself, but he doesn't. It says in verse 14, when he went ashore, he saw the gr- a great crowd And he had compassion on them, and he healed their sick. Not just some of them, but he spent the entire day right through to the evening healing every person that he's brought to him. The compassion of Jesus upon the desperate crowds. Verse 19, Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass, and taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing. Then he broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the crowds. And they all ate and were satisfied. Who's Je- What's the compassion we see in Jesus here? It's on his hungry listeners. Here we see Jesus sees a need in, in the people who are around him, and he just has this compassion that just overflows to them. And it's not just a compassion and thought only, like what it talks about in James, where if you see someone who is, who is hungry or needs clothing, you say, be fed, and you pray for them. But Jesus doesn't just... Think good thoughts towards him. He actually ministers to them, and he actually acts in order to meet that that need. So we have the compassion of Jesus. And finally, we have have, uh, Peter, who is is doubting. 
he's falling, he's sinking, and we see Jesus has compassion on his doubting disciple. And he reaches out his hand and he brings him back up into the water. So these four groups that we show the compassion of Jesus, the weary workers, the desperate crowds, the hungry listeners, and the doubting disciple. Now, I love each of these groups because each of these reveal to us a practical lesson about Jesus. And the first one is this, the weary workers. This shows us that Jesus doesn't doesn't just care about your usefulness, he cares about you. And I think sometimes you almost get this feeling that God loves us because, because we we, we teach other people about him, and, and, he wants, and he wants to, he really cares that we, we go door knocking, or we go land out leaflets, or we sing up in church, or we do all these great things. That's why God cares about us. But let me tell you, God cares much more about your usefulness. He actually cares just about you. The desperate crowds shows us that Jesus is never too busy. In Hebrews, it says that Jesus upholds the universe by the word of his power. Jesus is a pretty busy person, and he's keeping the universe in track. Here on this earth, he has thousands and thousands of people, but nowhere do we see that Jesus is too busy for someone. And here he goes all the way across the sea, desperate to find some time by himself, and there's all these people, but Jesus has time for them. Jesus is never too busy. What about the hungry listeners? It shows us that, yes, Jesus cares about your future, but he also cares about your day-to-day as well. And again, we sometimes think that Jesus cares about our spiritual comfort. He He cares about saving us for eternity. And it doesn't matter what happens at the moment, but he cares all about what's going to happen in the future. But let me tell you as well that Jesus cares about your life, and he cares about your day-to-day. He cares about um, when you're running late, He cares about when you're looking for that car park. He cares about when you're wondering what you're going to wear for the day or wondering how you're going to do the exam for that, for that, um, that you're doing at school, whatever it is. Our day-to-day needs, Jesus cares about them as well. What about the doubting disciple? When we're struggling with faith, Jesus' stance is an outstretched hand. Isn't that comforting? Peter there is sinking and he's doubting and he's spiritually struggling in that moment. He says, Lord, save me. And instantly, Jesus' stance is this, the outstretched hand ready to to bring rescue to Peter. And Jesus' stance for us is exactly the same as well. Now, the gospel is all about good news. and, And what I believe is the good news that is being presented from this chapter is this, and that is the one with all the power, also has all the compassion. The one with all the power also has all the compassion. If Jesus was just powerful but not compassionate, that would not be good news. He would be a tyrant. He would be this controlling dictator of the universe. If Jesus was just compassionate but he didn't have power, he would be a person of great intentions but not able to do anything about it. But Jesus is both all-powerful and all-compassionate, and let me tell you, that is good news. The power of Jesus and his divinity, the power of Jesus and his compassion, the power of Jesus and our experience. Throughout this story, we see Jesus meeting whatever need that he comes across, and he shows that he has the power to do so. And we get this sense that it doesn't matter what goes wrong in our life, Jesus is going to be there to help us. But maybe there's someone here today who's thinking, well, why isn't he helping me? Why is it that Jesus is so compassionate and so powerful and yet is not intervening in my circumstance? And let me remind you that there's a story in chapter 14 which haunts the rest of the chapter. And that is the story of John the Baptist. Jesus is helping the sick, he's helping the hungry, he's helping the doubting. But yet at the beginning of the story, we see John the Baptist who's there in prison, hoping for rescue. And then comes along um, Herod and, and, and orders his execution. Maybe Jesus will come through at this last minute, but no. John the Baptist has his head knocked off, he's put on a platter, and it's served up to Herodias. 
What about John the Baptist? Where was the compassion of Jesus? Where was the power of Jesus when John needed it the most? As I was reading through um, the book Desire of Ages, which was written by Ellen White, one of the pioneers of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, um, I came across a number of insights as to why Jesus didn't rescue John in that moment. And in fact, I came across four reasons why John was left to die there in prison. And here they are. Number one, it says, Jesus did not interpose to deliver his servant. He knew that John would bear the test. Okay? One of the reasons Jesus left John there was because he knew that he had the faith to endure the trial that was put before him. Jesus knew John could bear the test. Number two, it says, Gladly would the Savior have come to John to brighten the dungeon gloom with his own presence, but he was not to place himself in the hands of enemies and imperil his own mission. What was the mission of Jesus? To come down to this earth, to train up a bunch of disciples, to die upon the cross for our sins, to bring salvation to the universe, to, to the all of the world, including to John the Baptist. And Jesus knew that to put himself, if he went straight to John the Baptist's cell, he would have imperiled his mission and imperiled his life before it was time. And so we see that Jesus had to preserve the plan of salvation and prioritize in this situation John's Eternal salvation over his momentary salvation. Number three, it says, Gladly would he have delivered his faithful servant, that's John, but for the sake of thousands who in after years must pass from prison to death, John was to drink the cup of martyrdom. Jesus knew that there would be thousands of people through the centuries and the millennia to come who would have to face a very similar situation. And there have been. People have been who have been killed by the sword, people have been killed by being burnt at the stake. All sorts of persecution has come upon, upon Christ's people throughout the, throughout the years. And Jesus knew that the story of John the Baptist would serve as an encouragement for those people to persevere when times get incredibly dark. And what would John have done if he was let, if he was let go? He would have gone around, he would have preached his message of repentance and maybe saved some but maybe Jesus knew that he would save more in his death than in his rescue. So his experience was to strengthen others. Number four, it says, Satan was permitted to cut short the earthly life of God's messenger, but that life which is hid with Christ in God, the destroyer, could not, uh, he could not reach. The destroyer could not reach. Death itself only placed him forever beyond the power of temptation. Was it a bad thing that John died? Well, in some ways it was. Like it's, it was really nasty, and, and his disciples mourned about it. Jesus was so deeply saddened about it. But in the death of John the Baptist, his life was eternally secured for salvation. So his death only secured him for eternity. So Jesus looks down upon the situation in John. He has compassion. He has the power to, to, to rescue him, but he leaves him there because he has a purpose in the suffering. It doesn't mean he brought upon that, but in God's um, omniscience, he knows the end from the beginning. He realized that, that that was the best thing in that situation. There's a quote that comes at the end of this 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 um, passage in Desire of Ages. And I think this is one of, it's one of the most powerful quotes that I've read recently from Ellen White, and it says this, God never leads his children otherwise than they would choose to be led if they could see the end from the beginning and discern the glory of the purpose which they are fulfilling as co-workers with him. Did you get that? That means that God sees things differently to we do. And that if we could see the world from God's perspective, if we could see the, the, the aspects of the great controversy that God is working out, 
if we could see the end from the beginning, if we could see the trials that lie in our future, and we could see what God sees, we would choose the exact path that God is currently leading us on. Does it take faith to believe that promise? Huge amount of faith. But that's it's, it's true. God is, has compassion upon us. Even John the Baptist, it pained him. It was a terrible thing. He didn't orchestrate the death of John the Baptist, but God was still leading in his life. The power of Jesus and our experience. Number four, the power of Jesus and our contribution. Let's go back to Matthew chapter 14, and we're going to read verse 15 through to 19. This is where Jesus is feeding the 5,000, and it says, uh, now, uh, now, when it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, This is a desolate place, and the day is now over. Send the crowds away to go into the villages to buy them for themselves food. But Jesus sa- said, They need not go away. You give them something to eat. They said to him, We only have five loaves here and two fish. And he said, Bring them to me. Then he ordered them, and he sits on the ground, and then... They all get this big feast. Can you imagine being one of those disciples and just hearing Jesus say, you give them something to eat? What would you have been thinking? For me, I would have looked out and gone, ah, Jesus, we have five little pieces of bread here and two fish. Uh, If we divide this amongst everyone, they're not going to be getting very much food today. Maybe even like a fraction of a fraction of a crumb Like, it's not going to go very far. Jesus, this is impossible. Why are you asking us to do such a silly request? Now, this situation reminds me of something else that Jesus has asked us to do. And that is the Great Commission. The mission that Jesus has given us to go into the world and to preach the good news of Jesus. Let me remind you what that is. I've got three verses here. Matthew 28, verse 19. Jesus says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 1 verse 8, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Uh, Revelation 14 verse 6, then I saw another angel flying directly overhead with an eternal gospel, the eternal good news to proclaim to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, language, and people. That is our mission. Is that a difficult mission? Is that an impossible mission? Now here at Kingslift Church, sometimes we have one baptism, maybe two baptisms, maybe five baptisms, maybe 15 baptisms and the year's done. And in that time, how many babies have been born? How many people have been added to our population? How far further behind are we than when we began? You think of the billion people in Europe, the billion of people in India, the billion people in China, How many of those do not know about the good news of Jesus? And how effective are we at actually making significant progress towards meeting that goal? Is it an impossible mission? Well, let me tell you, this story gives me hope. That if God can feed the 5,000 men and the 20,000 people with five loaves and two fishes, then maybe God can complete the mission that he has given us to do. Now, something that also struck me as I was reading through this part of the story is, why did Jesus need those five loaves and two fish? Did he need them? If you recall, now remember, Jesus here is, there's all these sort of echoes of back, right back to um, Jesus, oh, the, the Israelites in the wilderness. And there's, God has, the great I am God, has control over the Red Sea. And can you think of any times back then where, God provided a whole lot of hungry people with food. How much food did they have to bring first for, in that situation? There was none. Jesus rained down manna for heaven, from heaven, not to 20,000, but if you look at the numbers, it's probably more like 2 million people over 40 years in the wilderness. Is Jesus capable of, of feeding all these people without the five loaves and the two fish? Absolutely. He didn't need them to then go around. He could have just said, Flicked his fingers and all the, all the bread just fell down from him and they would have had a lovely, lovely meal. Why did Jesus want them to contribute to the mission? In Steps to Christ, 
one of my favorite books. If you haven't read Steps to Christ, you need to read Steps to Christ. One of the, a beautiful um, book about getting to know Jesus and what it takes to be a follower of Christ. And, and Ellen White says this in there, God might have, this is speaking of the Great Commission, God might have committed the message of the gospel and all the work of loving ministry to the heavenly angels. He might have employed other means for accomplishing his purpose. Does that make you feel needed? God doesn't need us as much as we think he needs us sometimes. Sometimes you think, man, if I, don't, if, I don't, if I don't tell this person about Jesus, how will they be saved? Well, there's lots of ways that God can save someone. He could just employ the angels. They could come down here. They would know the scriptures better. They would be more eloquent. They, could, they have much greater skills than us. So why does God use us? He goes on to say, But in his infinite love, he chose to make us co-workers with himself, with Christ and the angels, that we might share the blessings, the joy, the spiritual uplifting which results from this unselfish ministry. Is God calling us because he needs us? Or is God calling us because we need the calling? We need to be involved in the mission of Jesus to grow into the people that God wants us to be. She goes on to say, those who thus devote themselves to unselfish effort for the good of others are most surely working out their own salvation. It reminds me of something in Timothy that says, where Paul is exhorting Timothy to be true to his calling, and he, and he says, until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to preaching and to teaching, watch your life and doctrine closely, preserve, preserve in them, because if you do, you'll save who? You'll save both yourself and your hearers as well. There's something about serving others through sharing the bread of life, the good news about salvation with them, that changes us, that grows us. When you have a Bible study to give, let me tell you, you're going to be on your knees that week, praying to God to help you, to give you the strength. When you feel completely out of your, your, um, your, your gift, your talent, and, and your comfort zone, when you're sharing Jesus with others, others you're going to sense a much greater need of a deeper experience with God, of a closer connection. You're going to pray more um, when that person comes to you and says, I was wondering about this text in the Bible. Can you, do you have any answers for this text? And you think, I have no idea about that. That's going to drive you back to Scripture. You're going to plead with God. You're going to wrestle with Him. You're going to re- delve into Scripture on a deeper level than maybe you, you've never done before. And my experience is that the best way to learn is through teaching. And Jesus, Jesus here has given us the mission, the great commission to go to every nation, every tribe, every language, every pe- people, to be witnesses, to preach the good news of, of his salvation. Not because God needs us, but because God in his love has chosen to use us in that task so that we can develop the characters and the growth that he wants to see in our lives. And I've heard a number of, of pastors say that these words that say, that I've heard a couple people say, when I got called to ministry, I thought God called me to save others. But then I realized he called me to save myself. And when you look at this, God has called all of us because he is set on bringing salvation to all of us. Saving others saves ourselves. Point number five, the power of Jesus and our focus. After the death of John, Jesus wanted to be alone. Why? He wanted to spend time with his Father in heaven. Now, there's a couple of reasons. He wanted to, he was deeply sorrowful and grieving over the death of John the John the Baptist, so that was pointing backwards, but also that was a foreshadowing of the death Jesus would die upon the cross, and Jesus having a, a renewed, a fresh sort of image of what he would do upon what his mission was, he realized that he needs to be close to his Father in heaven if he's ever going to complete the mission that he's been put on this earth for. And so he goes across, he spends the whole day ministering to people, and at the end of it, he just, he just needs time with God, and he searches for it, and he sends the disciples away, and he sends the crowds away, and he finds himself all alone. Verse 22, verse, chapter 14 and verse 22 says, Immediately he made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain 
uh, by himself to pray. And when evening came, he was there alone. But the boat by this time was a long way from the land, beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them, walking on the sea. The fourth watch of the night, that referred to the Romans had this system of time where they broke the night up into four watches. This is for the rotation of their guards. Um, it was just a way that they, it was the time periods where the, where the rotations happened with the, the, the army and the, and the guards with the Romans. And so the first watch was from six to nine. The second watch was from nine to 12. The third watch was from nine to three. So the fourth watch is that last period of time before sun, sunrise. So how long has Jesus been praying? Basically the entire night. And you get this sense that, that Matthew in writing this is trying to make this connection clear to us that the power of Jesus is connected with the relationship that Jesus had with his Father in heaven. How could he minister to so many people and have all this power coming from him? Well, he is God, but also as our example, he's showing us that it's the time spent on the mountain alone that empowers him to spend the time with the multitudes. I want to read for you a verse in John chapter 14, verse 12, which is a pretty incredible verse. It says, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do, because I am going to the Father. When you think of what Jesus did, and then he says to us by extension, that we will do the same works that he did. Is that a bit daunting? Okay, I find it daunting. In this story, can you think of anyone who did the works of Jesus? The the part of the story that stands out to me is Peter. Jesus is walking on the waves, up on the wave, down, up, down, up, down, in the storm, and Peter says, command me to come out to you. And says, come. And Peter comes out. Is, G- is Peter doing the works of Jesus? He is. He's G- Jesus walked in the waves. Peter is walking in the waves. But then what happened? What made him fall? He took his eyes off Jesus. And he looked around and he saw the wind and he saw the waves. And when he took his eyes off the problem solver and he focused on the problem itself, suddenly he found himself sinking into the, uh, into the sea. But then, when he fixed his eyes back upon Jesus and he said, Lord, save me, immediately the power of Jesus was returned to him to continue doing the works of Jesus. We overcome trials and temptations not by focusing on them, and this is a really important point, but by focusing on Jesus. The power of Jesus and our focus Jesus' his power is available to us to live the Christian journey that he has called us to. But we must keep our eyes fixed upon Jesus. So let's look at them in summary. The power of Jesus and his divinity, the power of Jesus and compassion, the power of Jesus and our experience, the power of Jesus and our contribution, the power of Jesus and our focus. What is the take-home message for you this week? How does, this inter- how does this connect with your daily life? How does this... We're all in different places. What is the message that God has given you today? The power of Jesus and his divinity. Um, maybe it is simply to realize that, that Jesus is all-powerful, and whatever problem that we're going through, Jesus actually has the power to, to bring about a solution in that situation, to renew our faith in the all-powerful one. Maybe that's your challenge for this week. Maybe... Your challenge is to again realize that Jesus not only has all the power, but he also has all the compassion. And he has all the compassion. He has compassion on you in your circumstances. And Jesus' heart, he sees you, he feels for your situation, and he's willing to get his hands dirty with bringing about a solution for you. The power of Jesus and our experience. Maybe you're thinking, okay, Jesus is all powerful, he's all compassionate, but what about my situation? Maybe it's time for you to get on your knees and pray, and God continues to lead your way in there. Say, God, I don't know why this is happening, but give me the faith to, to continue to trust in you. The power of Jesus and our contribution. Jesus knows that we grow best when we're doing things. 
a lot of Christians are spiritually obese. We know that if we eat, 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 and we never exercise, then we get, spirit, we get physically larger. The same is true with our, with our spiritual walk as well. If we feed, we come to church, we learn, we learn, we study our Bibles, and we, we fill ourselves with all this spiritual bread of life, but we don't exercise it, then we don't grow up to be the, the people that God wants us to be. And so God has called us, not because He needs us, but because you need the challenge in your life to exercise your faith, to be encouraged to go deeper in your walk with Jesus. And finally, Jesus, power of Jesus and our focus. The most dangerous thing we can do is be um, just not worry about the time you spend with God and just be a little bit flippant about the whole thing and, oh, we'll, we'll spend a bit of time here and there, but we'll just, we, it's too dangerous to do that. Jesus has everything that we need to live the Christian life, but we need to be connected to the source of power. And we do that just like Jesus did upon the mountain, spending time alone with his Father in heaven. And we do that just like Peter, when he took his eyes off his problem and said, you know what? The real solution is fixing my eyes upon Jesus. So whatever your challenge is for this week, I encourage you to take hold of the power of God, the power of Jesus in your life this week. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we just are so thankful that, that you are not only all-powerful, but that you are also all-compassionate, that you love us and you care about our problems, Lord, and you actually have the power to do something about it. And Father, we pray that you would increase our faith, increase our focus upon you, increase our desire to take part of the mission that you've called us to, Lord. Help us to become everything that you want us to be, Lord, help us actually do the works of Jesus. And we know that we can't do it in our own strength, Father. We know that, that to do it in our strength is like Jesus trying to walk on water by himself. To do it in our own strength is trying to feed 5,000 with a few loaves of bread and a couple of fish. Jesus, we pray that you would empower us. Take what we have, Lord. We surrender what we have to you. Take it, bless it, give it back to us, Lord, and change the world in and through us is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, greetings from beautiful and sunny Kingscliff, Australia. I want to take just a moment of your time, first of all, to thank you for tuning in, watching the program. I trust it was a blessing to you and your soul, drawing you closer to God and His will for your life. I also want to let you know that we are planning a significant expansion of our existing media ministry here at the Kingscliff Church. To find out more about this expansion and how you can get involved, go to bringitkingscliff.com. You can go either to the home page or to the Our Gifts page to find out how you can come alongside us and support, not just with your viewership, but also financially and with your prayers. Hey, thanks again so much for watching and take care.